A very good evening, everyone. Uh, let us start this digital book launch by welcoming our esteemed guests, panel members, author Professor Pankaj Jalote, officials from Sage Publishing, and our audience. I request Professor Ranjan Bose, Director of Triple IT Delhi, to deliver the welcome address. You are on mute, sir. If you have to unmute yourself. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. All right. A very good evening to all of you. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the virtual book launch ceremony for the book Building Research Universities in India by Professor Pankaj Jalhote, the founding director of Triple IIT Delhi. Pankaj, as you know, is a great academician and truly a hands-on person from the perspective of building a research university from scratch. We definitely need some world-class research universities in India. This book is a first of its kind from the Indian perspective and will hopefully pave the way for setting up of world-class research universities in India. In some sense, it is a sum total of all the varied experiences that Pankaj has gathered over the years. So let us get started with the function. Uh, let me first invite our chairman, Board of Governors at IIIT Delhi and former president NASCOM, Mr. Kiran Karnik, to say a few words on this occasion. Mr. Karnik. Thank you, Ranjan, and uh, good evening to all friends in India, and good day to those participating from elsewhere in different parts of the globe where it may not be evening. Uh, this is uh, an event of some significance, and I'll say in a moment why I think so. But first, congratulations to Professor Jagote. Pankaj, delighted that your book has, you know, come out and you know your work over the last year is there so congratulations i wish we could all have a physical presence and have a release in the sense of more traditional sense but this is good in some ways because it enables much wider participation and facilitates those who may not have been able to travel to join in uh, virtually you know i said this is a milestone for a particular reason and that is the fact that as far as i could see from the literature easily available this is the first book that explores research universities in India. And it does so not only in some depth, but also in the perspective of looking at research universities elsewhere in the world and looking at what insights we might gain. Uh, I found it fascinating to see the kind of work that Pankaj had done in this, based not only on his own experience, but a lot of data. And the data itself throws up some facts which uh, are probably known widely in the university and academic community, but which are not widely recognized and acknowledged. Uh, the first is that when you look at world-class universities, a vast majority of them are old. They're not new universities. So while our aspirations to be in the top 100, the top 50, at least the top 200 are very valid, we need to understand the constraint or the reality of the fact that it is typically universities that are older and much older, a century plus, that typically make the cut for top universities. Uh, one caveat, and I'll come to that in a moment. The second is that all of them, uh, something like 80 to 90% are substantially bigger than our single institution, high quality institutes in India, which means that each of them has certainly much more than 10,000 students. And the third is that a majority of them a multidiscipline and the multidisciplinary in a broad sense, which means it covers humanity, social sciences, technology. On the other hand, our institutes of excellence in India, barring very few exceptions, are those that have grown and had their genesis in being single discipline places. And some of them have tried to go beyond that, but the majority yet stay restricted in the broad area in which they work. Uh, be it technology, uh, management, law, design. And I think in all these areas, we do have some institutes that can make the cut in world class. May not be rankings because the rankings take account of a variety of factors, but they're recognized as being truly of some quality and excellence. What amazed me, and I mentioned that I'll come to that in a moment, is that while a majority of the universities in the top ranks in the world are older universities, in India, barring probably one, maybe two exceptions, which I won't name, uh, our older universities have you know, been going downhill 
by and large. And, uh, you know, if I look at the old universities, and let me mention names at the cost of those from there feeling offended, the universities in, in Madras, the University of Bombay, you know, Mumbai, University of Calcutta, uh, Allahabad University, these were the early universities in India set up in times long before independence. And I don't think in my very subjective assessment, barring maybe limited things here and there, any of these would make the cut in the top even 50 in India today. And it's sad to say so, but they are the older ones. Whereas those established in the later years after independence, by and large, as I said earlier, the single discipline ones, like the IITs, the IIMs, a few of the law schools, they have been able to establish high quality, substantially in the teaching area, but also a little bit in the research area. And this is where, again, the significance of Pankaj's book is important because we have recognized more and more that while a great deal can be done by teaching students and producing high quality output, a country like ours, given its size, its ambition, and the role we want to and can play, needs to have a strong base of its own research. We cannot live on borrowed research and then learn that and take it forward by making incremental changes and improvements. We need basic research on a large scale. And around the world, basic research is best done in the universities. In India, our system started where a lot of research is done and a lot of development work is done in laboratories set up as independent entities, uh, which may not have been a bad thing. Some of them have done excellent work, and I think they really excel in much of the things they do. But it's been at the cost of the universities. The universities have suffered. There's not enough funding. There's not enough attention. And the universities on their part, and again, a biased view, most of them have tended to be you know, cocooned in their own little world. Uh, many of them prefer to stay on the side of doing some publishing of with peers. And many of the PhD thesis that I'm not an expert on, but do look at, really reflect some of the work done a few years ago in the top places in the world elsewhere and take off a little bit from that. The original research, the substantive research in universities has been low. And yet, that has to be the underpinning and the foundation as we move forward in the country and see how not just science and technology, but indeed humanities and the arts can play a role in our development, both of individuals and of the country. And in this, without research, we are not going to get very far. And this to me, therefore, is of tremendous importance to understand what are the dimensions, the critical factors, the possibilities, that shape a research university. I don't think there's a template which we can borrow and translate into India and transplant it here and say, look, this is the magic formula. I think we've got to do a lot of adaptation, a lot of learning, but there are some things which we can probably take, borrow, maybe adapt a little bit and understand. And I, I do see that the kind of work that this book has laid out does have some indications of that. One of the things which is critical, and I do want to mention this and end on this point because it's a favorite bee in my bonnet, is that for excellence, you need to have the freedom to try out things, to experiment, to make mistakes, to occasionally fail, to do something new. Whether it's research, where something works out and something doesn't, whether it's an entrepreneur trying to work on a new product and the business works, sometimes it doesn't, the product you know, makes it or it doesn't, or it's a university trying out new courses and new things. And unless our universities and institutes have the autonomy and freedom to be able to experiment, not just in terms of courses, but in terms of how the institute is run, whom they recruit, what kind of norms they have, how do they admit students, a whole gamut of things that ranges from faculty to students to administration and governance and management. Unless we allow a substantial degree of freedom, it will not work, and particularly so in a country that is so diverse and so different as in India. In fact, that's a blessing. We can use that to do all kinds of things. Instead, what we have had for decades now is a very ossified, highly structured, highly centralized, control-based regulatory system for higher education. It's a one-size-fits-all game where somebody in some place in one of our regulatory agencies decides things, they try to pick what they think are best practices, which may be so, but they're not applicable everywhere. But then they issue something and then they try to micromanage. 
And over the regulator, you have the ministry where some bureaucrat at a low level thinks he's higher than our university vice chancellors. And I think it's horrifying. I feel strongly, as I said, it's a be in my bonnet, so I express this very clearly at the cost of offending a lot of people, that I've seen places where, you know, the director or the vice chancellor is to be recruited for a top institute. <laughs> the eight people sitting in a common room waiting to be interviewed. I mean, this is shameful. In the good institutes, they will search for people, invite them, persuade them to come, bring them to the institute and sell the institute to them, saying, hey, here's a great opportunity. Come and take charge and read Instead of having eight people rounded up with some bureaucrat sitting there, served you know, occasional tea and made to wait for hours, I don't think this is the way to treat our academics. And I think we've got it all wrong. If we are to look and learn and how to get good universities and certainly good research universities, autonomy, freedom, flexibility, and respect for academics is absolutely critical. And to me, I, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but unless we change these basic factors, I don't think we will make much progress. Just giving more money, calling an institute an institute of excellence, getting 10 you know, institutes recognized and saying you can have 100 crores each. But then you follow GFRs, you go to the lowest bidder, you can't recruit this faculty because he doesn't have nine and a half, he has nine and a half years and not 10 years of experience. All kinds of rigid rules which don't work. We need to be liberated from those if we need to move forward. And I am hopeful that discussions like this and books like Pankaj's will trigger some debate and discussion on these. And I may be wrong, but I think we need a debate and discussion to take this forward and see how best to create great universities in India. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karnak. Uh, uh, let me now invite Professor Philip Altbach, the founding director of the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College, to share a few words. Professor Altbach. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my uh, respect and admiration for Pankaj Jalote. I think that he is maybe the first person who's really focusing in a detailed way on um, uh, the need for and some guidelines to research universities in India, an extremely important uh, uh, topic. Uh, and secondly, I'd like to say that uh, I am a little bit humbled uh, and certainly honored by being the only non-Indian in this uh, important uh, and interesting uh, event. So for me, it's an honor um, and I'm really delighted to be with you all. Philip, you uh, must tell uh, people that you, uh, for your PhD and post PhD, you spend considerable time in Bombay. You must share that. <laughs> uh, yes, that's, that, that's true. Back in the days of the dinosaurs, uh, I um, did my PhD research uh, in Bombay and wrote a dissertation which became a book uh, on uh, student political activism in, in, uh, in India. So I go back a long time and um, I've kept an interest uh, in Indian developments, especially in higher education, <clears throat> over uh, half a century. So I have great admiration, interest, uh, and some um, concerns about the Indian uh, context. But you guys are living it and working it every day. So you know much more than I. Uh, I'd like to make just a few um, observations, uh, not in any particular order of importance, uh, very much from the outside uh, about what I think are the challenges and also the prospects. First of all, there is kind of a flourishing for the first time in my experience in the Indian context of actual interesting thinking about higher education in the country. Uh, and that must mean something, some both the government uh, and a lot of people, including all of those on this webinar, uh, are thinking new thoughts about uh, higher education for the first time, maybe ever, certainly in a long time. And uh, I think that's actually quite important. I think it's also important, uh, and you folks are recognize it, uh, recognizing it, and let us hope that others do as well, 
that uh, India is increasingly important on the world stage in many areas, including in higher education. I would say that Indians are doing world-class research and Indians are managing world-class universities, but not in India. They're doing it abroad. And we have one person on this, uh, uh, on this call who is in fact an Indian, but who's managing a world-class university in the United States. And I'm looking forward to hearing from him too. Uh, the point is that Indians need to do this in India. And all of the points that Kiran have, has made, I completely agree with uh, in terms of the challenges that, uh, that, that exist. It's important as we think about research universities and world-class institutions to understand that they exist and Pankaj points this out in his book, they exist in the context of systems of higher education. That is, research universities are at the top of a system. And that means also that a country, a state, needs to think through what the rest of the system looks like and try to make sure that the research universities are somehow integrated into that system. And that, in my humble opinion, has been lacking in India. It, by the way, it's lacking in many other places too um, from, from the beginning. How do these universities fit? All Indian universities should not be research universities, only, only a few. And figuring out which ones, both the pub, uh, public ones and private ones, it has been pointed out by Karen that one can hardly think of a state-run Indian university, which is a, even aspiring to be world-class at the moment. And it's the case that if you look at the rankings, most, many of the world-class universities that are recognized around the world are public institutions. Indeed, it's only in the United States and a little bit in Japan where you've got private, serious research universities. So grappling, as Karen mentioned, with the challenges of the public sector institutions in India is of absolute central uh, importance. Um, I happen to be a member of the Russian government's University Excellence Commission, so-called 5100 Committee. Uh, it includes, by the way, three or four foreigners and a bunch of uh, and a bunch of Russians. Um, and by the way, when India is thinking about its development, yes, of course, it needs to be basically Swadeshi, but looking outside, as Pankaj has done in his book. Um, uh, is important and maybe even taking expertise from outside experts. And you probably have enough NRI outside experts that you can just use real Indians who are not living in India to do this. But the point is uh, the Russians have, ex have expended in the last decade uh, about 3.2 billion US dollar equivalent in 21 universities which they have recognized and the idea for the public was to get five of them ranked in the top 100. Well, on the one hand, they have completely failed to do that. Um, and the first phase of the program is now en ended. There's gonna be a second phase coming, but um, the Russians have succeeded in doing some very important things. They have gotten the idea of world-class, of serious research, they have gotten the idea, which is a little bit valid in India too, of integrating non-university research institutions into the university sector. The Russian Academy of Science has been the main output for research uh, in the country since the Soviet revolution. Um, and that's changing. So it takes time, as has been pointed out, 
and it takes a commitment and you're not going to have complete complete success right away so i think i'll conclude there i think there are a lot of challenges but what pankaj has starting started in his book and what others in india are thinking through both in the private sector and by the way the funds and the initiatives and the ideas which can be seen in some of the new private startup universities in india i think are very promising and it would be a good idea and you can see this in the history of american higher education when the private startups the chicagos uh, and others in the end of the 19th century had a profound influence on the public universities and i think that this is a way of getting new ideas into the system and maybe maybe some of those private startups will be world class research universities at some point so the book is a fountain of new ideas just getting the debate going is very valuable and for that we can all thank pankaj and i hope this is the beginning of a discussion and certainly not the end so thank you very much thank you professor altbeck uh let me now invite pankaj to give us an overview of the book and to share some of the insights from the book pankaj uh thanks ranjan thanks everyone for joining uh so uh philip and uh uh mr karnik have written the you know of the first 10 pages the preface uh, the 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 introduction and foreword is by them so of the first 10 pages are actually written by them more <laughs> first couple of pages so i'm just going to briefly give an overview of this i think the discussion is so interesting of the general theme that we'll sort of go on that but a friend of mine called me i mean after this he says you know how do, essentially he was talking about how do you go about writing a book so i thought maybe i'll just start a little bit on that so a book clearly has of course a theme a subject a topic and then it has contents it has so so clearly you need an interesting topic to write on so some people will read and then the contents have to be such that each chapter is tied to the subject and the second important point is that collectively the chapters you have the content you have sort of give you some sense of completeness about the subject right and that's what the book is about it's not an article it's a book now if you look take this framework for a book then actually for research universities in india what should go in the book sort of starts falling out right since the title is research universities in india uh, we need to talk about universities and research universities in india itself so there is the first chapter is really that and how do they compare with the global research universities so that's really what the first chapter is about but then i think research universities are also not well defined or understood in the indian context so the second chapter just looks at the concept of research universities. how are research universities differentiated from the other so so the frameworks for classification of university what are the characteristics of a research university and you know sometimes you know a naive thinking maybe research university just does research but you see globally uh, all the major research universities have a very very strong and thriving and and the top education program most of them would have 60% 70% of their students as undergraduates you know something we 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 don't think we want to create a research university we want to get out of that so 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 characteristics of a research university etc is what i discuss in the in the second chapter so then what is the research university about so all universities have three main mission how university started research got added as the second mission after humboldt uh, model came into being and now progressively over the last half uh, century or so universities are being looked upon to do what is called third mission basically contribute to entrepreneurship and social outreach and so, so we i have basically the, the book has three chapters one on each one of them and i just wanted to you know in this i realized that education is really 
the main activity which universities do as a collective organizational activity. Research is something that groups of people do, individuals do. Similarly, entrepreneurship, etc., is some groups of people do. Universities facilitate them by creating environment, but education is something which universities collectively. I mean, to graduate a student, 40, 50 of us have to really teach the student before the student gets, gets a degree. So, so there is a fair amount of, uh, you know, this thing I spent on uh, in the chapter about how do you design rigorous programs? How do we ensure good quality education? Which of course we know there's just so much talk about quality of education uh, in India and therefore, you know, how do we build uh, feedback loops, etc. So that's, that's what, that's what, uh, that's what we talk in the chapter on education. On, on research, I think, you know, because it's, it, it's not like a corporate where you make a strategy and then sort of go, you know, too much in strategies. It's far more about enabling environment, about having a research culture, about having good research ethics. And that's why the focus of that chapter is much more on these things rather than research governance. And in third mission, all of us now everywhere across the world are talking about entrepreneurship, we're doing it. Uh, but I think in India, we have not, uh, we sort of entrepreneurship is one thing, but in India, there is actually a lot more which is possible to do in the social outreach, uh, this thing. Uh, but you have to really not burden the faculty. So, so, so I, I discuss at least one example from IIIT how we do a very good job, uh, one particular model of doing it, but you leveraging the student power, but, but helping reach out uh, in this thing. So that these were the three missions of any university, uh, yeah, research universities will give more emphasis to some. And the two things that really separate research universities from the rest are the PhD program and how, what kind of faculty they have, how do they manage the faculty. So that's what, that's what the next two chapters discussed. And I realized PhD program is something that in some ways accreditation and all those frameworks do not look at because you know, they focus on the education aspect and the governance aspect and so on. So, so and but by much to my uh, uh, de delight, there is now growing thinking about PhD programs going on in the last one or two decades, and there are books now coming out. So, so I, I, I really find you know uh, this was a, a, a good good thought. Uh, this thing to talk about what is a good PhD program? What does it mean to be a good PhD program? Uh, what, how do you prepare people for research and the careers which are after PhD, which are not just teaching, but so many more. And here I give a case study of, of IIIT Delhi's PhD program, because we, we had put in a lot of thought in, 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 in it and many of the requirements that we had laid out were we were able to do. Faculty recruitment and management that, of course, everyone in India knows is the big thing to do is, uh, is really in, in research universities, all research finally rests on faculty, right? After all, they drive, even the PhD students are supervised by them. So unless you recruit the right faculty, you're not going to, to, to be able to do much. But more importantly, and I think this is where in India, we've not done a very good job, is nurturing of faculty or faculty administration. And that's where I think in IIIT, we, we were able to take uh, many, many uh, uh, initiatives on that front in, in trying to uh, have, uh, you know, faculty governance, uh, manage administration, because I really believe, how do you prevent faculty complacency? I, I really have, my experience is that that's one of the key issues which we need to uh, figure out in our university systems, how do we do that the faculty are able to achieve what they're capable of achieving and not become complacent and very happy with whatever little they are able to. So that, that, that is what we discuss in the, in the chapter on faculty. And of course, the next important thing is critical is governance and leadership, right? We cannot, we see, we read about all kinds of things in our in our in, in Indian newspapers. We, as Mr. Karnik mentioned, uh, interference from a host of agencies. So we don't really fully understand what does autonomy mean. I think we don't fully even understand or articulate what does academic freedom mean. 
you know, you to, to, to tell someone you meet a, you know, bureaucrat or someone and you say, look, I as director can't tell a faculty member what he should work on is not something easily, easily appreciated and understood. I, you know, so just this concept of academic freedom and needs to be understood better. So, so the governance governance uh, chapter, you know, I studied also and put down some thoughts about some very foundational principles on governance, including uh, shared governance, autonomy, because the governance in university is very different from governance in corporate, extremely different. You know, we have shared governance, uh, we have academic freedom, you know, both these, these kinds of things don't exist. And then leadership is, of course, a very, very important issue. And given the way Indian system is expanding, we really, really need a lot more leaders to come up to lead institutions. Um, uh, we, so, so, so that is one thing it talks about. And then uh, the, the, the last uh, sort of content chapter is financing of research universities. And here, my main thing I wanted to point out, which I learned, which we had also been trying to do in IIIT, is to separately look at cost and financing of education and cost and financing of research. In India, we don't do that, uh, uh, but, but there are various models which look at it. And in IIIT, we have been actually promoting with the government, the model that look, for a public university, the capital, the infrastructure has to come from the government. You please bear it. We will make education self-supporting because education can be somewhat considered as generating private growth. With, while, while providing safeguards for people coming from poorer families. But hey, look, research is a common good, public good, and we must get public money. So that's a model we've been promoting and I, by and large the government at least conceptually has understood and the model is also playing out. Now, of course, the budgets have gone bad. So there is a there is challenge there. But I think this is a scalable model in the Indian context uh, uh, where, uh, where education still remains very, very highly subsidized. And yet we need so many resources to grow, grow this thing. And the last chapter is really just my, uh, some of my thoughts and wishes about what higher education system may be able to do or should be doing to support research universities and what research universities themselves can do to strengthen themselves, right? So uh, the, the good thing is that the new education policy has thankfully some of those elements. I think that the, the one or two things which, which uh, which uh, haven't come and we've been trying to, through the STIP committee, you know, have some higher education research centers. We invest so much money in higher education, but we don't really have any higher education research centers. So that's one thought. And, and also such a large system, but we don't have professional administration programs for, for higher education. So these are, you know, things which I didn't see in, in, in MEP also. So these are some of the points which I mentioned there. And for higher, for research universities, uh, really most of us, you know, in the business will know about strengthening research culture, etc. Uh, but I do want to point out, you know, uh, importance of trying to think about how do you prevent faculty complacency, and and how do we improve teaching and learning by setting up teaching learning. And so there's about half a dozen in each one of them. Okay, so so I, I think you know I hope that those interested in higher education will benefit from the book. And as both uh, Kiran and Philip has, have pointed out, hope this leads to a discussion. And that discussion leads to so many of us are thinkers who are there to come up with better ideas, you know, and so on and so forth, that this, this invigorates a discussion and, uh, and then we find ways how we can strengthen further uh, research universities in India, because that is indeed very important. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining. And over to you, Ranjit. Thank you, Pankaj. Uh, thank you for covering some of the interesting facts, for uncovering some of the unknown facts between the covers of your book. Uh, so we will now request comments from our eminent panelists. But before that, we will start with a personal recorded message from Mr. Narayan Murthy, the co-founder of Infosys. Can we have the video, please? Professor Pankaj Jalote is a rare academician 
who believes in the paradigm, do it first and then write about it. This book is the distilled wisdom of his 10 plus year journey in creating a first class research and higher education university in India. Pankaj's aim in his own words is to add value to educationists, creators, and policy wonks who have a desire to create a world-class R&D-led university that is globally respected for research and education, that has thriving undergraduate and postgraduate programs, that is socially relevant, that is industry-facing, and that is globally connected. The task of creating a globally respected research university is still a far dream in India. Sri Kiran has put it well in his foreword, and I quote him. He said, even the, in the best institutions, the amount and quality of research is hardly compatible or sorry, comparable with the best in the leading global universities. If they have made a name for themselves, that is the Indian educational institutions, it is more through the quality and achievements of their graduates rather than through their research output, unquote. Pankaj speaks about various factors that help in producing good quality research, attracting independent thinking students and futuristic faculty, good and hassle-free governance, research ethics and culture, combining research with classroom teaching, R&D funding from the private sector, academic and financial autonomy, enhancing interactions with the global intellectual diaspora and the contribution of Indian research output to the betterment of our society, among many other factors that he speaks about. This is the first book to address this important subject of creating a good research institution in India. It is a welcome addition to our libraries. I entirely agree with Pankaj on his prescriptions. I also believe that there are additional things we have to contemplate to make our research system more useful to the society. We would do well to remember the words of Professor Richard Hamming of the US Naval Postgraduate School of Monterey that the task of a college teacher is to prepare students for the student's future and not learn about the teacher's past. My own view is that success in research at the university level requires creating a sense of curiosity, independent thinking, observation of nature, identifying the limitations of nature, and a blind mind to overcome those limitations using Socratic method, using open book examination system, discussion and debate at the primary and secondary education level to the extent possible, and finally, learning to learn orientation. Our primary and secondary education and even our competitive examinations are unduly focused on road learning and memorizing patterns. Most Indian universities do not encourage their PhD students to identify on their own the problem they want to solve for their PhD thesis like it happens in the US universities. I wholeheartedly endorse this book I believe that this book is a must-read book for every stakeholder of the research and higher education system in the country.
Okay. Uh, it is now my honor to invite the panelists. I first request Professor Ashutosh Sharma, DST Secretary, to kindly say a few words. Professor Sharma. How few? <laughs> That's for you to define. Please oh, share your thoughts. Oh, oh, wonderful. Okay. Uh, that's so good. I, I got this platform. Thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, it was very heartening, in fact, to read. I have not read the whole book, but I have read parts of it, and I have suddenly read the contents uh, page, uh, which pretty much covers, as Pankaj said, uh, the anatomy and physiology, uh, if you would, of uh, research universities in India. Now, we, of course, we heard from uh, Kiran about the static and bureaucratic nature of universities. That's certainly true. Uh, and of course, Philip said that he's not Indian, but I saw a Saraswati hanging behind him. So that makes you honorary Indian. Uh, I think that we would uh, you know, give him the title of honorary Indian, uh, if, you, if he would accept it. Uh, so that would be great. Uh, I think we already looked very deeply, and of course, Pankaj has very deep insights both into education and into research, and in fact, how they connect or not connect with each other. And I would just say a few points about where they don't connect and why they don't connect and what's the problem in our universities about education and research not connecting. And of course, there have to be solutions for that. Merely stating the problem, uh, it serves some purpose, uh, okay, but not a whole lot. Um, so let's just look at where are the points of tension uh, between research and education in a typical university in India. Now, of course, uh, they, the university is organized around departments. Of course, there are departments in everywhere in the US and elsewhere, but they don't have very tight compartmentalization anymore. Uh, so in, in, I'm a chemical engineer. I know so many professors teaching there who got background in chemistry, physics, material science, what have you, biology, biosciences. I guarantee you that in none of the Indian universities, including IITs, they would actually welcome a faculty member uh, who did his undergrad in physics and PhD in chemical engineering. To put it crudely, every director, every dean, every head, uh, you know, they, they will all say, yeah, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. Uh, you know, we sing actually uh, great songs about all of this. But when it comes to action, not one of them is empowered actually to, to hire even a brilliant person uh, who, who has, uh, you know, who, who brings to the table some very unique strengths. So, um, and crudely put, basically they would say, Ye Radha mere mein na you know, I, I have to have total control, uh, you know, over these people that I recruit, that I promote, uh, that I do anything with, right? So, see, one solution to this problem is that you need to have a two layered system. Departments came up as response to undergraduate teaching. Uh, so we, we need to offer certain kind of courses and stuff and that's done by department because very homogeneous. They all have the background to do those courses. Now, beyond that, we need to have another structure, which is this research structure. And uh, half the recruitments happen through research structure, call it a school, call it whatever you want, uh, you know, and then half the promotions and recruitments actually have to happen uh, through that structure. Uh, and so in that structure, you have mechanical engineer, chemist, physicist, electrical engineer, whoever, who are all basically looking at problems and solving them. So there is a tension in terms of administrative units. Uh, and because we don't have the flexibility to hire people who are truly multidisciplinary, uh, we would have to create these structures. We would have to understand the meaning of it. And, you know, I've had so many discussions with Pankaj about this. He is, by the way, we have a new policy on science, technology, innovation policy 2020 coming up. It most likely would come in the first, uh, uh, you know, early 2021. But, you know, just to keep people working around the clock, we call it policy 2020, right? It's not going to happen. But anyways, 
Pankaj has been a great part of that. He was chairing this um, uh, the session or, or the committee uh, on uh, on research in uh, education uh, in higher education, right? Which is of course a compelling aspect of it. Uh, so he has contributed many good thoughts on this, and I hope that he also got some thoughts uh, from from you know talking to these people. Anyway, coming to the points of conflict uh, between research or the tension uh, between university structure and research uh, structure. You see, a university structure typically in India, it follows the model of teaching, which is oriental, which means if you want to learn something, you sit at the feet of your guru. Now, the, the model for research is that you climb your guru's shoulder you know, stand on the shoulder of your guru and try to look some distance. Clearly, both of these positions cannot be satisfied simultaneously. There is a bit of tension, instability, if you would. If you want to sit at the feet and have a passive learning, or you want to create new ideas and go beyond your guru. That's a very cultural issue, uh, and that's not really understood even by the professors uh, in the universities. Then, of course, there's a you see, the, another issue that I just want to present here for, for discussion and for thinking, uh, and we have had this discussion with Pankaj. When we talk about research in universities, it's only one half the knowledge system. So research in university uh, would uh, be incomplete if we did not know the directions of that research, the relevance of that research, where that research is going to go, and I'm only, in this I'm talking about what is called the applied research, if you would. Uh, okay, if we know about, if we talk about basic research, then we have to respect how profound it is, how original it is, how creative it is, uh, how disruptive it might be, and not, not simply be a follower of Harvard, MIT, whoever, right? So that independent thinking, that critical thinking would be required at the same time, if we had no direction for this research, then I, I don't see why it would be called applied research at all. So the prob the major problem is not in knowledge creation. Uh, if you look at IITs, you look at some of the good universities, if you were to give them a problem, they would probably solve it. The problem is, is that problem worth solving? Uh, is there some taker for that problem, for the solution? So oftentimes people are doing by habit what they have been trained to do for two more decades or four more decades. And of course, uh, there is a you know, constant thing about publishing papers and stuff. That's very well, uh, right? Uh, but uh, the, the, the problem actually is in knowledge consumption. And the reason I'm saying this is because we may often be barking up the wrong tree in saying, look, how do we strengthen our knowledge creation systems? Of course, they need to be strengthened. I have no doubt about it. But at the end of the day, what would you do with this knowledge is, is not very clear to anybody. And that part of the problem lies outside the university, uh, which is uh, in the, knowledge, the connect uh, with the knowledge consumption. And we have to pay, uh, you know, pay equal um, uh, attention to that particular aspect. Um, we, finally, I'll just conclude by saying that um, we, we need uh, in research, we need flexibility, we need empowerment for people who are doing it. Uh, it's so much so that today, actually, you know, if you told me something about research universities uh, 10 years ago, in the true sense of university, like our state universities and so on, I would say it's an oxymoron. It does not exist. There are some universities who do fairly well. There are some groups in every university who are very good, and there are individuals who are very, very good. Right, but as a whole, this uh, ecosystem that would promote research, uh, there's, is, I mean, you can count 100 ways it is missing. So I would not even start working on it or tell you how it is, but I would just say, look, we need flexibility. We need participation of the larger ecosystem of knowledge in our university, and how is that made possible? So uh, to just give you an example, and also the bureaucratic control of ministries and, and so on. We can, all, we can totally get rid of it. Uh, and I will give you an example. 
a new mission that we started, Cyber Physical Systems, is worth about half a billion dollars, which means with purchase power parity, it means something. Uh, now it's setting up these hubs. There are 25 of those. And each of this hub is a not-for-profit company. And they are given all the powers. In fact, they have more power than the secretary of science and technology in the country. Because we are governed by very narrow and straight rules. But uh, through the cabinet, we have given all these powers to the hubs for the management of money. They can recruit people at market rates. They can bring professors from abroad and pay them whatever their salary there is. Uh, they, can, they can give money to industry, a for-profit industry. They can take money from industry. So absolutely, and they can juggle their budget, which means if you have this capital and then you have something else and you can't figure out, I mean, it has to be dynamic, but in government, it cannot be dynamic. So, so all these flexibilities are already there. There are another mission coming up on quantum technologies, which is worth over a billion dollars. And it will contain all of these flexibilities. Um, and uh, of course, my friend Kiran is saying, I, I better shut up. Uh, so I'm going to do that indeed. <laughs> right? I I'm so sorry I, I spoke so long. Um, you see, this is actually a point. These are things that we can discuss really. Minimum two days. Uh, one person is speaking for two days. right? And at the end of it, we must find solutions which are going to make sense, which are going to, which are going to work in the Indian context. I haven't, so, so when I start talking about policy, I already tell people two things. You must have a strategy for implementation as a part of this policy. And you convince that these are actionable items and who is going to do it and how it is going to be done and so on. So if we think through this entire thing, then I think we are, we are going to really not only have done deep thinking, deep dive, identified our problems, real problems. I mean, not just philosophical problems. Uh, and then, uh, you know, go about doing it uh, one by one, so to say. Uh, so, Pankaj, thanks. I love going. I, we, we wrote an article together on some of the things that I'm discussing. Uh, it, it has been turned down by every newspaper in the country. Uh, I think we did too deep a dive. Uh, and people say, no, 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 no. You just tell us, you know, they say, hey, things are not working. I think it's perfectly okay, uh, right? And then, then people would read and feel very happy because negative news is always a good news. Uh, so Pankaj, don't give up. We, we're going to rewrite some part of it and then we will do it. Thank you so much. Ranjan, let me interrupt you for a moment yeah, and please. tell Dr. Sharma that I, I wanted him, in fact, to go on. What I was saying to myself is what he said about the flexibility is so much music to my ears. And so yeah. I was saying, please to go my, on. To my going. ears too. Really, really. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, sometimes people think because I'm sitting in this office that I'm somehow different. No, I, I, I've spent many sleepless nights thinking about what the hell is wrong with us. And we are the first, I mean, we, each one of us has to know what's wrong with us, right? Then only we can fix, uh, actually in a committed way, other things, because it has to begin at home, right? I, I can't tell you, you know, what you should do. I think you know better. And anyway, my telling is not going to matter very much. Uh, so we clean up our uh, house and each one of us do that. I think it's going to work. See. One major problem with universities and science technology is that we have great sense of privileges, but very little sense of uh, uh, responsibility uh, and, and accountability. So often in the name of saying, look, no, 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 just give me money. Don't ask me no questions. You know, this is such a deep rooted cultural aspect, right? And, and this is one of the problems, which are very serious problem uh, with the scientific community and especially in universities, I would just, you know, you unleash the devil. Uh, Kiran, you should have just said, please shut up now. Okay, right. I'll just tell you one incident. I was talking to Professor Manmohan Sharma yesterday. He, he went on for one hour telling me all his lots of experiences from the past. Uh, and then he said, you know, um, they were, you know, IICT in Mumbai. Uh, Indian uh, you know, Institute of Chemical Technology, very famous place. 
it was part of mumbai university at some point and he said it was impossible to operate and so now they have become another state university and now he is saying it's impossible to operate <laughs> right and, and by the way thinking about mumbai university bombay university once i was talking to the vice chancellor i said your the annual insa uh, you know uh, meeting was going to be in that university and he was saying what is insa really i mean you, you see so i'm i'm not making this up and so that tells you about the quality and culture of the top leadership in many of these universities and i better not speak about hiring practices uh, right uh, and uh, if i was not in this office i would speak about them i know them inside out right so with all of this stuff i mean we still have to make progress and this is a very difficult task because unless we understand the dimensions of this problem look there are two ways that if you have a bucket full of money or water there are two ways you can use it to lose it one is uh, you know you you throw this bucket full of water in desert or you throw this bucket full of water in the sea okay and i, I can give you examples of both right it's not a good use of that resource ah uh, you have to throw it where there is some hope of having some green shoots uh, coming out from there first to begin with and you know so there then you get into really deep weaknesses and start fixing them uh, sorry pankaj now now i'm really going to quit sorry sorry <laughs> <laughs> thanks thanks thank you me. professor sharma uh, let me now invite professor satish tripathi president at university of buffalo to share his thoughts please professor tripathi good afternoon and uh, good evening uh, good morning uh, thank you for inviting me uh, first of all uh, let me say buffalo hello to uh, two of the people who have spent time in buffalo one as a faculty member that's uh, philip for many year and one as a student that's uh, asutosh so so welcome buffalo welcome to to both of you uh, uh, you know as uh, uh, you heard earlier in the video that uh, pankaj does things and then he writes it actually so i've known pankaj for last la long time we have worked together we have written papers together and we talk a lot as well and so pankaj actually wrote his first book after he spent time with infosys and learned about the software engineering and then he wrote about it so all his books actually have been doing it learning it writing and of course uh, going to the next topic so so pankaj congratulations on finishing the book uh, uh, this is really a great uh, conversation starter it's a very complete book actually as you heard from pankaj goes from classification to different aspects of research universities and uh, definitely data driven which is one of the things that we have to really think about it's not just defining the research universities but how do we evaluate research universities so i have two comments actually i know the uh, the time is short so i have one comment that actually is about the size of the universities or the composition of the universities and this was really mentioned by kiran earlier and uh, pankaj talks about that as well in his book uh, the the uh, you know being a research university involves as astosh said multidisciplinary set of people not just the scientists is the social scientist is the people in other disciplines uh, coming together actually and solving the real problems so in order for a university to be really well recognized we have to have universities with multidisciplinary studies going on and and if you look at what uh, france has done lately and philip knows this much better than i do i mean if, if you think about the university of paris saclay they actually took many of the research institutions around it and these are world class research institution these are like the csir labs if you think and they have combined those with the universities in a loose fashion and all of sudden that university has shot up to number 14 in the world in some one of the rankings so so i think we have to think and and kiran talked about the csir labs and other labs as well and i think we have to think about in terms of the research universities how to make them a full university and how to get people from multiple disciplines to come together this is something that i'm sure pankaj is going to talk more about although in his book it's really a small piece uh, 
but I think it's a very important factor to think about. It's also good for undergraduate students to be connected to these research labs. I mean, they're separated completely. And I, you know, talked about this before many times. I think it's important to get them connected to universities. And, and that really is one way. And there's a lot of good research going on. And as Tosh said, that there are a lot of good people working individually. How do we combine them together? So that's one aspect. The other aspect really is the culture. And I'm not talking about the culture, you know, in, in terms of uh, just the culture of the faculty. I'm talking about the culture of administration. You know, th this is really something that's very important. We have appoint administrators and their culture almost changes. They become bureaucrats right away. For university to be a good university, what are the two major components that you have to worry about? It's the faculty and it's the students. The rest of us really are just auxiliary. You know, we really are there to make sure that things happen. And, and Ashito saluted that some of that actually in terms of uh, the, the, the independence and, and the flexibility. My feeling is if the thinking in a university is about supporting the faculty, giving them the flexibility, making sure that the students have opportunities, then the university will automatically be a good research university. And this is what exactly, you know, so, so I have served as a department chair, I've served as a dean, I've served as a provost, I've served as president now. And people ask me, how has your job changed? And I always say my job hasn't changed. My job is to get the best faculty I can get. And I'll do anything to do that to get to the campus and retain them. You know, in, in US actually people move around quite a bit. So it's not just getting people, but how do you retain them? So I said, my job hasn't changed really. The institution is built by the faculty. The rest of the infrastructure, the other aspects really can be developed. So I think if we get the fa best faculty, nurture them and provide the opportunities for the students, that's how we create the best research universities. And, 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 and this is uh, Pankaj, the, the next topic. You've talked about this a little bit but it needs more, uh, more work on it. But congratulations again. I really uh, appreciate uh, inviting me to this. This is a great discussion, but as uh, has been said before, this is just the beginning of the discussion, not the, the end of the topic. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tripathi. Uh, let me now invite Professor Ram Gopal Rao, Director, IIT Delhi, to share his thoughts. Professor Rao. Thank you, Professor Bose. First of all, my hearty congratulations to Pankaj Jalote. I think it's a nice book. I've read half of it. I think I will finish the other half, maybe in the next one week. But I think I do see a lot of uh, quantitative analysis. For the first time, I found nice tables and data, you know, which I always wanted to uh, have. And I, I see that uh, you've done a lot of work in collecting all that data, I think, which is a nice thing. And I think we can go on about talking uh, about our universities, uh, but if you ask me, I think uh, you know India has done well, can do better. You know, we started with 16% literacy rate when India got independence from 16%. Now there are states talking of 100% literacy. 90% of Indians were below the poverty line when we got independence in 73 years. Now almost 300 million people have come out of poverty. Our life expectancy was 27 years. Now it is 70 years. I think we have made a progress, but unfortunately, you know, for a country where hunger is on the list of problems, nothing else is, is above that. I think nothing else can get a priority. That has been the approach of uh, government of India. You know, first let us become richer, let us do better with these people, and then we will focus on education kind of a thing. I think maybe the priorities could have been different, but you cannot blame anybody, you know, for not prioritizing higher education in this country because the problems were severe and you know that needed to be done at that time. I think they have done that, which is okay. I don't mind. But to me, if you, you know, since there is not much time, you know, I would only say there are two things, uh, you know, that are important for higher education right now. I think one of them is competition and the other is autonomy. I think the competition now exists in our system. Every day now, every week, there is some ranking coming up. One week we go up, another week we go down. And you know, I'm tired of these rankings now. I think there is so much of competition now among these universities we have created, but that is not coupled with the autonomy. 
now the autonomy part is becoming only worse unfortunately and i am hoping that the national education policy will address that autonomy in terms of financial autonomy autonomy in terms of administrative autonomy i think these are the two things as directors we seem to have some powers in fact uh, and many of us are only tinkering with the system because there is this fear of three c's you know the, the there is a cbi there is a cag there is a cbc i think this the fear of you know all of these agencies you know is only making directors very powerless we are all tinkering with the system though we have all the powers to do many bigger things i think that is a that is a fear that has got created now in our minds which is very unfortunate i think unless our institutions become free from these government controls unless our appointment processes improve i i don't see any future for higher education in this country frankly we will only be doing going up one week going down the other week but nothing else will change in this educational system unless we get full autonomy either autonomy again can be of two types where you can have institutions run by faculty you can have institutions run by alumni we neither have any of this we are institutions run by you know some bureaucrats sitting in some place right now i think uh, you know we need to find those autonomy models which will work for india and progress otherwise i personally don't see any future for higher education right now and i am confident the nep will make a difference i think nep talks about all the right things in fact as uh, pankaj jalote also in his book at various places talks about nep the national education policy if implemented right you know i can tell you there is a huge transformation that will happen in the higher education system in india thank you absolutely thank you thank you professor rao for sharing those thoughts now i have the privilege of inviting professor anil sahasrabuddhe chairman aicte uh, professor sahasrabuddhe your comments please uh, good evening everyone uh, it is too late in the day i think time is already over uh, but i'm like slog overs in a cricket match <laughs> i'm coming at the tail end of and uh, professor philip uh, uh, as well as kiran karnik have illustrated entirely about what uh, dr pankaj jalote has tried to do in terms of creating research universities in india in fact this is never talked about in india creating good research universities and therefore this book is timely congratulations to dr pankaj for doing all of this then ram gopal ashutosh narayan murthy everyone has spoken about various aspects including dr satish tripathi so i would like to be very brief national education policy certainly has those elements which can really trigger the change transform is very very important you know thing which is likely to happen and that's why we must all look at it uh, you know ashutosh referred to dr mm M. sharma he was made professor in ud city at the age of 27 can that autonomy be enjoyed by any university or iit today there will be 100 questions asked and therefore all of you what you are saying non interference both from political side bureaucratic side and as pointed out by even uh, ram gopal rao that directors even though they have autonomy they don't want to use it because their finance bureau will put obstacles they will say no no you can't do this gfr doesn't allow this and so on and so forth and therefore completely giving freedom to the institutions not only academic but financial is very very important and if you do that small change also will bring in lot of benefits i'm just giving an example of uh, what we started doing with smart india hackathons as well as inculcating the spirit of innovation through mhrd's innovation cell and we have jumped the numbers from 81st position 5 years ago to 48th position in innovation ranking of india so that is possible so if you look at the number of publications india produces today it is in the fifth largest producing country in terms of research publication but when it comes to the top quartile we are poor and therefore it is not just competition which uh, you know uh, ram gopal said it's important competition coupled with collaboration between different universities iits is important whether it is collaboration between industry csir dae isro drdo i think kiran knows it very well he has been a change agent in different places turning around things which were in bad shape and now this policy has come from another isro giant that is dr kasturi rangan we have a lot of hopes a lot of things including national research foundation where it's something similar to nsf there is going to be a lot of support for research i'm sure uh, many of these things will start happening but we should not be too you know uh, dissident in this particular case because in our own country during the times of takshila nalanda 
we had uh, excellent work that was being done. It's not that research is quite something new to us, actually. How do we resurrect it back is what we need to do. And therefore, if the policy is supporting the correct funding, a lot of liberal attitude, and all those administrators who have the power must use those powers. I think if you do that, we will certainly be creating world-class research universities in India. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Sahasrabuddhe. Uh, let me thank our panelists for their valuable time and for their wonderful words. What is great is that a discussion has started, and that is, I think, one of the purposes of this book. I'm sure this book will seed more debates and pave the way for setting up world-class research universities in India. Uh, we will now move on to the Q&A session with the author. The panel members are free to stay or sign off as per their convenience. I have a question. Yes. Uh, to Anil Saisbude. I'm so happy to see your new avatar. I mean, <laughs> I, I see it every two weeks. It's, uh, it's looking like, uh, you know, real Rishi. <laughs> uh, of course, now it's looking like real Rishi. You were always real Rishi. But it, it's also looking like that now. It's so fantastic. So when are you going to get to the barber? Uh, after That's the, a question. After Corona is taken care of. <laughs> I, I thought it was when you make a research university. <laughs> that you have to wait very long. Okay, all the best. So once again, thank you, dear panelists, for that very, very invigorating session and a very nice discussion that we have started off today. Let me now hand over the mic to Pallavi for the Q&A session with the author. Thank you and stay safe. Thanks a lot, Professor Bose. I request everyone to drop their questions in the chat box or click on the raise hand button to let us unmute you. For those of you who have joined us through YouTube can also leave their questions in the comment section and we will try to take as many as possible. Do we have a question for the author? Or it could be a statement if somebody com wants to, uh, some comment. That should be fine because most of the people here would be academic. They may want to That's say right. some questions. So uh, Aryan Taneja is asking some experiences at Triple IIT Delhi for the Triple IIT community maybe. So what's the question? It's some experiences as at Triple IIT for the Triple IIT community. So some experiences you have uh, experienced at Triple IT did. Oh, I see. I, I think, you know, I, I would say in general, one thing I was just listening and I, I just messaged to Mr. Karnik. I think we've been very, very fortunate that I think the student body, the faculty body was completely aligned. We never had any of these things and we listened to students. And I think the board was aligned and very nicely, the, we, we went through two governments. Uh, you know, the first uh, earlier government, which started it and the current government and both of them really supported us and allowed us to do things the way we were doing. And I think that really, uh, you know, the, the help, the support from, if you get it from all quarters, it just multiplies in many, many ways. It just infuses you in so many ways to, to make things happen. And I think that way our institute has been very fortunate very fortunate and uh, many of my uh, these things recollections are about support either from student or somebody else saying thing or somebody's parents saying something etc uh, so grace is asking how can we encourage collaborations across indian institutions uh, yes that grace you really uh, you've been here what now about eight, a year and a half two years that has been uh, that has been a challenge for for way, for strange reasons well for various reasons uh, indians uh, indian faculty members feel more comfortable collaborating with 
collaborators outside rather than inside and i don't know how that would uh, how that would be there uh, uh, but, but but the main main for any collaboration you somebody has to reach out to somebody else okay and this is about where your eyes are set who are you looking at for at peers and so on and maybe because our community by by the ecosystem uh, the, the the critical mass or the mass of researchers in any field is so small perhaps that's the reason that they don't communicate with each other but yes that's something i've not understood it has been observed but i really don't know if, what is the solution to it so rajiv says are they uh, do the observations are valid for non science based so uh, so uh, while while i'm sure because of my background uh, there would be limitations in what i would say but i think i tried to to talk about uh, research in general uh, so so i think many of the things would certainly and and things like autonomy uh, academic freedom about the quality of education program phd program those are clearly very very general not tied to not tied to science or non science or technology so i think that should be that should be you know there professor jain says i think one of the areas that needs to be considered while assessing excellence of a university is the impact it has had on the community that nurtures it uh, uh, i uh, yes there is uh, the impact assessment of what the university there is no doubt about it uh, that it should it should be not just about citations and publications but and that's why as you as you know in iit uh, we say uh, you know the technology is developed and deployed so that because we were a tech institute when but broadly we looked at technology and for impact we do allow all kinds of things to be stated in your annual report Uh, but it's a ab absolutely excellent point that we should not be very narrow about impact as academic impact in fact if at all the world is moving towards uh towards uh is viewing academic impact as a much smaller uh component of overall impact i you can see that trend globally everywhere people are expecting it to be much to have a bigger impact than just academic Arishab uh, Prant says, "How can universities focus and promote practical application of knowledge rather than rote learning exams?" And uh, well, I mean, this is not very hard. Many institutions do it. We certainly do it. It's a long topic. Uh, promote practical application. You know, it comes in the education as to how do you design courses? What are the learning outcomes of the courses? How do you deliver those courses? So, so that is that is. possible we don't do it and certainly by the way in a, in a affiliated mode it's not really possible because you can't design uh, your exams you can't design your testing assessment so that it's only possible in autonomous institute what is mr anupam i wanted to say something yeah please yeah uh, pankaj this is anupam here so yeah. my question is more related to triple it delhi so you have been pioneer in bringing it up to this stage and ranjan is doing a great job in taking it forward so based on your learning what one or two things triple itd should do to make it a much better research institute <laughs> i think i think that we should do internal discussion <laughs> and ranjan would probably be leading it <laughs> but i think i think you know i i you know i'm a little out of touch for the last two years i would let ranjan address that rather than me addressing it <laughs> okay <laughs> okay so um, i mean last two we two years as you know i was on leave i've been on leave and i was not uh, not been following and i was focusing on the book and so mr rohit also wanted to say something sir yeah rohit please uh professor yeah professor pankaj this is dr rohit from uh, delhi technological university so my question is that uh, uh, all the panelists as well as you have uh, talked a lot about uh, the problems which we are facing uh, to uh, start the research universities in india but uh, we have hardly talked about the solutions so uh, my uh, 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 
uh, question is what about the solution and where to start with because uh, everywhere uh, you individually cannot go and make it triple id then so where no. to start with and uh, uh, what are the possible solutions no quite right quite right but if you see solutions were mentioned by everybody and in fact uh, you know for example people mentioned about academic freedom governance autonomy uh, and if you look at I mean, sorry sorry in a limited time everyone sort of focuses on very small amounts but if you see everyone was talking about some solutions you know you need a autonomy you need flexibility now if you look at in in the book i in each chapter you know in education i've really discussed how do you design education programs so education is rigorous so it's not the problem it's in fact all solution phd program it's all about how, what is the design of a phd program how do you go about again in governance we give actual examples of how you can do governance etc so in fact the book is all about that thing it may not be i mean those are some solutions or some approaches uh, and uh, hopefully with discussion more approaches will come but you have a point uh, maybe we we uh, unduly focus on on something but everyone talked about it and the book in each chapter we talk solutions so uh, dr tanma has a question uh, what is your thought about retaining undergraduate talents in india and encouraging them to do research in india what would be the role of indian government and institutes in this regard so so there is some there is clearly a need to do that and and if we uh, you know so i done a survey of undergraduate students some may 10 years ago in iits why do you go abroad for higher studies and what do you need or why don't you start to higher studies in india what do you need in india to uh, to be able to do your higher studies here and there were some some of those outcomes were there which actually led factored into the design of of uh, our phd program so a couple of things that are clearly we, uh, that that we are doing but we don't have enough funds for example we have this overseas research fellowship we have these uh, uh, joint phd programs you know these actually came out from the from what students say and they really can you know they would like to have uh, while studying in india they would still like to have global exposure for example right so that's where the joint program comes that's where overseas research fellowship comes so there are those elements which we can do and the role of indian government of course if they can you know start these fellowships and give give each university 50 50 overseas research fellowships for their 50 phd students every year 100 larger universities get 400 we tried once uh, building such scheme with dst long back uh, I, i was you know but it didn't go anywhere China, by the way, did that very effectively. Uh, we'll take some questions from YouTube, sir. Uh, Sartha yeah, Goyal yeah. wanted and let's, to. Let's try to end in about five ten minutes because it's dinner time for many many people, and let's not make it too late. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, sir. So Sartha Goyal wanted to ask, sir, would you like to throw some light on research universities across the world? What were your insights? Which universities are better, or which country is going well in general? so uh, i think mr karnik also referred and so on so the comparative study that i did was really around the so the scope and size it was really the effect the, the real thing that came out uh, the difference that came out from other globally uh, well known universities versus this is a hugely uh, hugely different in terms of size and scope our universities are narrow very small hardly very few you know beyond 10000 you look at global good universities research universities 80 90% are about 10000 so uh, clearly one main thing that has come out is that and the second thing that has come out is we have really very very under invested in in research in higher education i mean there is this global research investment which uh, which also as a country we are not at par with with various other countries but of that pie 80 90% does not come to universities while that ratio is far more in the favor of universities in most countries so in terms of global versus indian that is that is what I, i'm sure there is so much more yeah. so another question is do you address diversity of faculty and students as an objective of higher education particularly women in stem disciplines 
Uh, so, so in in to 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 be very clear. But let's let let us just make sure. So there is certain diversity in student body imposed on us being because we are state university through reservations, right? So there is some diversity. And we have tried some active measures to take, uh, uh, you know, to discuss how we can enroll more, more uh, uh, women students. And actually in the early stages of our MTech and PG uh, program, we phenomenally succeeded. In the first two years, if I remember correctly, we had more than 50% in MTech. We had more than 50% uh, students as women. I, I think the number has come down, but it is still there. And in terms of other, this thing, there isn't a stated policy, uh, uh, but, but I know in, from internal discussions, all of us are, would actually like to see particularly gender diversity. So, so we've, we've, all, we've sort of followed at least this, uh, this uh, unsaid principle that if everything else is equal, we must, uh, we should try to, uh, to, 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 to look at women candidates and also give them more benefit of doubt. You know, when there's doubt, explore rather than, rather than take, uh, take this thing. But I don't think we have stated policies 